Um, yeah, so uh, uh, some of you may already know this. Um, some of you may have been told by me. Um, I'm a lecturer here at Queen's in the computing department. Um, so I'm going to start this talk with something which will probably make you all hate me. And then hopefully you'll realize that it's, it's not as bad as it sounds. Um, so I've had a relatively interesting life, or I've certainly found it interesting. Um, I worked in the computer games industry for seven years. I um, then went and did a PhD in Southampton and a postdoc in Southampton. And then I did research up at ESID and computer vision and machine learning. Uh, went to different conferences and, and things like this. And over the course of my career, I've met all kinds of very interesting people. Um, many influential people, very successful people in different walks of life. And for those of you who, who may know me, um, I'm not the super um, humble person necessarily or uh, you know, relatively confident. Um, and I don't tend to get particularly nervous around these kinds of people. So throughout um, a lot of my education, and, and early stage of my life, I met these people, I was very comfortable talking to them, and do you know what I mean? I, I just generally felt, felt comfortable. Um, then there was a very important moment in my life. I was working in the games industry, and a friend uh, took, was out to the pub with a friend, and I was meeting one of their friends, um, and uh, a guy by the name of Francis, actually. Um, and I was chatting to him, and for the first time in my life, really, I think, um, I noticed that I was kind of nervous talking to this guy. Um, now, he worked for a company called CyberLife that was going bust at the time, actually. Um, they made a game called Creatures, if any of you have ever played it. Um, and he was just a, a very interesting guy. And there was a bunch of things about him that, that sort of struck me. Um, he was very calm. He, was, um, he, he had great uh, energy, breadth of technical knowledge, various things like this. Um, but one of the things that really struck me about him was that he, was, um, he seemed relatively unconcerned with um, traditional status or, or career. Uh, he was very interested in doing things that he thought was right. Um, not in an evangelical or preachy way. It, it just seemed... He seemed sort of serenely above all of these concerns. Uh, and I was so impressed with him. And I went back and I talked to my girlfriend, who's now my wife, and said, um, you know, I've just met this guy, Francis, and it's, uh, I've never had this feeling before. I was kind of nervous around him. I was nervous talking to him. And I realized um, that sort of deep down, this Francis represented to me a type of person that I wanted to be, that I sort of thought, you know, I met all these people, these amazing people, amazing reputations. Some of these guys at university were legendary people. Um, I knew the best in the year in computing and mathematics at Cambridge. I knew, you know, really, really uh, fantastic characters. And none of them had created this effect in me uh, the way Francis had. And so I thought, yeah, you know, I, should, I realized that's the person that I wanted to be. They, they captured these values. Um, so this is just sort of a little summary of the kind of qualities. And then for the rest of my life, I then sort of made choices and, and met people and tried to meet people who were a little bit like Francis. Um, these are just some of the qualities that, um, that, that Francis had and many of the other people that I've met had. And the two to point out was, as I mentioned before, this idea that they were doing what they thought was right. And this almost always expressed itself as, um, in fact, without exception, in fact, um, uh, embracing open source values, embracing the open community's values. So Francis, for example, he created Tortoise CVS, if any of you have heard of that, which has been called Tortoise Subversion and, and, and various other projects. He was part of a project um, to make a website called They Work For You. So when the Freedom of Information Act came out, um, he did data scraping that would show how politicians had voted in order to keep them accountable. A lot of journalists use that every day. So there's a lot of th activities that he was involved with, which I found very inspiring. And then I proceeded to meet a whole bunch of other people during the PhD. And, and one of the great things about being a lecturer at Queen's is meeting uh, students who have these qualities and have this personality. And I've always found it incredibly inspiring. And that's why I was so flattered when Johnny asked me to give a talk today, because um, I really feel, uh, you know, it's, there's nothing intellectual about it. It's a purely physiological reaction that the qualities of the open movement really capture something that 
really no other community that I've ever encountered, no other kind of success or uh, achievement in life has ever really gripped me in the way that the open movement has. Okay, so that's my little intro. Um, and now I also have to um, credit Johnny as well. So this talk is about setting up the makerspace at Queen's. But of course, it's not the first makerspace. There was something called a hackerspace um, that Johnny set up um, while he was here. Um, and so I have to give full credit to Johnny for, for what he was doing. So um, after Johnny left, which was a terrible pity, um, he obviously went on to other uh, bigger and better things. But um, um, I, uh, the, the hackerspace involvement in the hackerspace sort of died down a bit. And so um, there was some money available at the end of the year. And Phil, who's our director of education, says, has anyone got any ideas? And I said, well, if you give it to me, I'll set up a makerspace for you. And uh, little did he know when he said yes uh, what would happen. So uh, you've already seen the talk about Forrester. Forrester is an amazing place, you know, a wonderful example of, of a kind of makerspace. Um, we tend to call things makerspaces. You may notice I'm wearing a suit. I don't swear as much and various things like this. So the makerspaces is the, uh, is the uh, uh, more uh, friendly to the wider audience name for basically the same thing. Um, uh, exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, so uh, yeah, well, the, a little brief history of makerspaces. So um, and I'm sure that some of this is probably heretical, but this is my understanding of makerspaces. They started in, in Germany. They're a wonderful collaborative place for developing technology. Um, very much popularized in America. There's a bunch of very influential ones set up like uh, NYC Resistor and things like that. Grew across the world. Um, the typical model is kind of like a gym for people who love to make and modify technology. There's some kind of annual subscription. There's some cool tools and stuff like that. And it's very much focused on creating this optimistic, supportive community based around sharing. So it's inherently linked to the open movement. So you might ask yourself, why set up a makerspace in a university? Well, partly because they let me. Um, but from my point of view, one of the things I've been thinking about si since I've been a lecturer, my approach to engineering is reasonably straightforward. Um, just find the best thing in the entire world and copy it. Um, that's basically how I deal with things. So when it comes to, say, computing courses, um, it's slightly debatable, but most rankings would basically put MIT at the top, which is also wonderful because it's one of the birthplaces of open source software. So what's the difference between Queen's and MIT? Well, the first big difference is debt. So that is a single year's fees for MIT. So it's slightly different at Queen's. Um, another, one of the great things about MIT is most of their lecture and talk materials are available online. So you can go and check them out. And if you have a look at the talk material, you can see it's not a million miles away from the kind of things that we would, we would cover at Queen's. There is a slightly greater emphasis on immediately doing the latest technology, right? So um, you might go faster into, say, a, a deep learning rather than going through the, the early stages of m machine learning as we might do in our courses. And there's a bit of a steeper learning curve. Now, MIT classes are massive. Our classes are massive. Um, our classes span quite a range of background and experience. But um, in my experience, the students at the top end um, of our courses are as good as anyone anywhere in the world. I genuinely believe that. Um, the big, one of the big differences is projects. Now, we do lots of projects in our taught course. But this is what a typical MIT project looks like. So it looks more like the kind of thing that you would get out of a hackerspace. So something made out of Lego, some robotics. It's, a, it's an integration of a range of technical skills. So the idea of the makerspace, setting it up here, was to say, OK, well, let's give a more MIT experience to the students that want it, that are ready for it, that want a bit more from their degree course. So encourage the use of a sort of research level software and technology from as early as anyone can possibly tolerate it. Uh, inspire the best students to go further, right? Show them what is possible so that um, they can start to think like other students at some of these other universities as well. Help them develop their own projects and passion, defining quality not only of the people that I was talking about who really inspired me, um, but also of people who are very successful in the technology industry, is that they're always working on their own projects. Um, and encourage them to share what they make with others. Be, be involved in the open community and, and that kind of thing. 
So actually, this is not the first time I've ever set up a makerspace. Um, when I was doing my PhD and postdoc in Southampton, um, I sort of convinced some people to give me some space. And I have always had a, a massive collection of ridiculous tools. And they let me bring stuff in and violation of health and safety rules. And I had a whole bunch of power tools and all kinds of things in this room. And I invited a whole bunch of people to come along. And I learned a slightly, uh, slightly disturbing lesson. If you just do that and you sort of just bring everyone in, you get a certain kind of effect. Um, perhaps it doesn't happen all the time, but I've seen it happen a few times. You get a mixture of people who arrive. Some are more quiet, some are quite vocal. And some of the vocal ones will talk a lot, but they don't necessarily do projects. What you really want is people who are passionate about technology, who make projects in their own time. So sometimes the ones that talk a lot put off the ones that just want to get on and do things. Um, and so the ones that just want to get on and do things, they go away. And you end up basically with a social club with a lot of tools around you. Um, so one of the things I realized from that experience was how crucially important culture and getting the right people were. Okay? So um, I've been very concerned in, uh, so we've only been running for about six months, really, um, uh, that creating culture is very difficult, getting the right culture is, is very difficult. So uh, deliberately growing the place in slowly. Um, and another thing, especially being a lecturer, I'm very used to this kind of um, dynamic, um, dancing around in front of people being very enthusiastic. Um, and the, the key thing is there is not being an entertainer of a passive audience, and not being a teacher, in fact. Because the whole point is you're trying to get energized people who want to do their own projects, who have their own passion. So it's more like being a gardener and less like being a teacher. So very much waiting for the right people to come to you. So one of the things that I observed um, in running this place, which has been wonderful, I'm sure there's a lot of people who might, would like to be involved that, that aren't, but it, one thing that was a very good filter was that people who are very passionate about this would see the tools and they had their own project and they wanted to use the tools. So they would come to me or they would come to other people associated with the makerspace and they would say, I have the specific thing that I'm trying to do, can I use the tool for this purpose? So that was a wonderful filter for those people who really wanted to make projects. And then once they're in there, um, I do my best to try to not freak them out too much, but also to uh, find out as much about what their interests are, how, what their career interests are, how can I support them, and, and show them that advanced technology and the advanced possibilities that they have. And crucially, getting to the final stage, which, we, which we're sort of doing now, but we, we've got a lot further to go, really, in terms of getting them to help one another and support one another, um, really transition to that uh, community sense. So a few little uh, tips, some things that worked out surprisingly well so far. Um, well, one of the things was we had the make space, we had a bit of a budget for it, um, but we wanted to get it up and running you know, faster, and I was very passionate about this. I was basically copying the same model I used at Southampton. So I thought, OK, well, I've got this garage filled with stuff. My wife will be very, very glad to have rid of a, so a lot of it. So let's bring some stuff in. Um, so there's the Lego, for example. I've got masses of Technic Lego, various electrical, electronic testing tools and things like that. So we started bringing these things into the room. And one of the things I noticed was that as soon as you start sharing stuff and people sort of know that it's your stuff that you're bringing in, they start doing it as well. Partly as some sort of fairness motivation, I think, is part of it. But another thing is just um, seeing that that's, that's the normal thing. That's, that's sort of how it works. Um, it's worked particularly well for 3D printers. We keep gaining 3D printers about once a month. Um, people just keep bringing their, theirs along, which is fantastic. Um, and certainly, when you're at my stage of life, you've got, um, you know, you have a certain amount of, of money, and you can buy all these toys, but you have absolutely no time. So I have two young children, so I have zero time to play with these things. So I realized that I had a, probably about 10 expensive gadgets that I'd used exactly once, so I should probably bring them along to the makerspace and try to encourage other people to make use of them. Um, and that's worked really well. And one of the things which I cover actually on my ethics course is this wonderful thing called the Benjamin Franklin effect, which is that um, we tend, it's a sort of cognitive bias, I encourage you to go and search it. That's not exactly how Benjamin Franklin said it. But broadly speaking, once you start supporting people and being kind to people and, and offering things to people, 
you psychologically rationalize that in your head as meaning that you care for them. So if you're trying to create a culture that is open and supportive, encouraging this behavior has this wonderful side benefit that people start to be nice to one another. It's great. Another thing that I was very concerned with was ensuring th this bottom-up thing, right? You're trying to empower your users, trying to bring in students and um, make them feel more in control, more capable. And so one of my favorite things was br buying a label maker and bringing it in and then saying, um, how would you like to structure this space, right? Here's a label maker. Give it to, to one of the students um, and say, decide how you would like it to be put the labels on things. And the wonderful thing was, after that, the place was a lot more kind of organized. But it also had that psychological effect. You know, I don't know if you've ever done this. If you make a label and put it on something, it almost makes you feel like you own it, that it's part of something you know, that you control. So we tried to extend this to as much things as possible. Members manage the website. They control the Trello board for tasks. They have some control over the PCs. And the whole culture is about fostering trust and respect um, just, again, to try to empower the people associated with it. So the running of the makerspace, and like I say, it's only been going for about six months, so um, there's really three things that I concentrate on dealing with. The first one is the people who, who pay for the place, try to reassure them that they've spent uh, their money wisely and that they've um, wisely given me <laughs> the right responsibility to manage these rooms. So we support as many different university priority activities as we can. So lots of final year projects, uh, development weeks, open days, uh, things like this, um, to, to, to reassure them of the value of what we're doing. The second thing, which is also important for things like Belfast, trying to inspire and attract uh, the be typically the best students. So we have some of the best students in the year who come and, and make use of the place. Um, and we make these particularly, try to make some dramatic projects that might attract them, um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. And finally, we have this uh, priority, obviously, of nurturing these core members who we're hoping will take on more of a, a leadership role and also attract other people to the space. Um, and there's this core idea, which, you know, I, I teach first-year software engineering and a bunch of other ones as well, but first year software engineering is like over 300 people in the class, you know, first year students. And it's very apparent to anyone who teaches that many people that you don't have that great an ability to change the behavior of the people that you're talking to. You can scare the hell out of them and temporarily get them to do things, but if you want a kind of lasting change in their character, that's really determined by their peers. So the whole model of the makerspace is to try to bring in these people with this kind of personality, this motivation, and slowly bring in other students who will be influenced by their group, because I really believe in that. OK, so that's all the ideas. Let's look at some of the results. And apologies for some of these pictures. They were uh, made very hastily yesterday, um, just before I, I got home. Um, so we have lots of, of tools. Probably the one that everybody is most attracted to immediately is the 3D printers. We have quite a few 3D printers. We have a multi-material 3D printer. Um, I'm sure we will get other fancier things as well next year. Uh, we have a, a ridiculously expensive 3D scanner, which is primarily good for scanning people and faces. Um, mostly that's uh, Matthew, one of our, our lecturers, made a little bust with hairy bust. It's, uh, very complicated. Um, anyway, we have a laser cutter that is, uh, should be arriving soon. I have to resist the urge to talk through all of these things, but hopefully I have a little bit of padding if Andrew's not going to make it. Um, we have a cutting machine, which is super useful. It's just a blade. You can put pens in it and things. It's useful for all kinds of things. Loads of electronics tools, masses of Arduinos and Raspberry Pis. Masses of things that you plug into Arduinos and Raspberry Pis, cameras and motors, batteries. I'm a computer vision researcher, so we, we have every kind of camera sensing you can imagine. Technic Lego, a thing called Actibotics, which is a sort of aluminium Lego, sort of higher end sort of thing. Uh, lots of some GPU capable PCs. We definitely want to get more of those in the future for things like deep learning, um, which is incredibly exciting. Uh, if anyone wants to talk about deep learning, I'll do that until you fall asleep. Um, we have VR stuff as well, and, and we're getting more stuff all the time. So lots and lots of capabilities. 
Um, okay, so let's show some of the projects. So most of these are, uh, quite a few of these are sort of student-led projects, certainly these, these four around here. Um, and of course, there's lots of final year projects as well. And we cover a huge range of different things, which I will not try to talk about all of them. If anybody's interested, I do. I originally had slides in talking about some of these individual projects, and it was massively over time. So uh, unfortunately, you're just going to get a glimpse of this unless you come and ask me about it. Um, of course, we're here at an open source event. So um, what do we have in terms of uh, open source software? Well, almost every project that we would be involved with would have a solid foundation in open source software and hardware. Um, and while, of course, I'm a massive fan of open source software and hardware, the main reason for that is simply that it is the best software for the tools that we face, for the problems that we face. Um, particularly, you look at things like deep learning, almost all the academic work in this area and, and all, all the code that's been produced is open source. It's completely amazing. Um, affordable, low latency video streaming with Raspberry Pis, fantastic data input source. GNU Radio, wonderful if you want to do any kind of software, radio work. We do all kinds of projects for this. And some really exciting um, projects, which I'll show you some screenshots of, which is to do with um, automating farming and, and projects like that. And of course, my own little project, which I only managed to update once a year, so it's slightly embarrassing if you go and look at that. But the project is cool. Anyway, um, so yeah, so that's the source code, that's all of that. Um, I told you that the, the whole thing was um, come for the tools, stay for the people. That's really what the talk is all about getting the right people and doing the right things. I apologize to anyone in the room, especially if you're a member and you don't see your face here. It's probably because you weren't around yesterday, and that's why I didn't get a chance to take a picture of you. So some of these pictures are slightly staged. Um, some of them are real. Um, student robotics, um, not all members of student robotics are necessarily members of the makerspace, but Kevin is, and he is the driving force behind making the robot, so that counts for, for everything. Um, you can see there's a compulsory picture of Andrew, who's supposed to be up next, who's been in almost every talk we've had so far. Um, uh, so yeah, a fantastic, inspiring group of people. It, it always it makes my day when I go into the makerspace and I see people doing things and they've, they've come up with their own projects or they're driving something forwards. It's just, it's just amazing. I cannot believe that technically part of my job is to manage this place. Uh, it's absolutely wonderful. So the final thing to say, if any of this sounds appealing to you, um, we have a, a good way in if you happen to be a Queen's student. Um, if you're not a Queen's student, please come and talk to me anyway, because maybe we can work something out. But in terms of, uh, crucially in terms of this development week that we're running, 14th to the 18th of May, we've got uh, five big hitting projects that we're going to try to build in parallel over a week, a lot of them based on kits. So we have the FarmBot, which is a robotic gardener. That's kind of what it looks like when it's built. Um, the personal food computer, which I'm stressing out about because I haven't ordered the, all the parts for, um, but that's uh, an ideal growing environment based on uh, uh, aeroponics that NASA use. We've got our own custom designed industrial robot arm that we're working on, one of the, driven by one of the members, and a couple of other more software focused ones. One that is more sort of game engines, 3D, that sort of stuff computer vision tracking, one that is more machine learning and low latency video streaming. So awesome projects, hopefully you get involved. And, uh, and that's me, thank you very much.